Section 26 of the Complete Works of Tacitus, edited by Thomas Gordon, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Claude Banta. The Complete Works of Tacitus, to which are prefixed political discourses upon that author. Edited and translated by Thomas Gordon. Volume 1. The Annals, Book 3. Part 2. The Disgrace of Piso. A few days after, Vitellius, Voranius, and Severus were by the Senate preferred to the honors of the priesthood at the motion of Tiberius. To Volcinius he promised his interest in suffrage towards preferment, but advised him not to embarrass his eloquence by impetuosity. This was the end of revenging the death of Germanicus, an affair ambiguously related, not by those only who then lived and interested themselves in it, but likewise in following times. So dark and intricate are all the highest transactions, while some hold for certain facts the most precarious hearsays, others turn facts into falsehood, and both are swallowed and improved by the credulity of posterity. Drusus went now without the city, there to renew the ceremony of the auspices, and presently re-entered in the triumph of ovation. A few days after died Vespania his mother, of all the children of Agrippa, the only one who made a pacific end. The rest manifestly perished, or are believed to have perished, by the sword, poison, and famine. The same year, Tacfarinus, whom I have mentioned to have been the former summer defeated by Camillus, renewed the war in Africa, first by roving devastations, so sudden that they unscaped unchastised. Next he sacked towns and bore away mighty plunder. At last he bejured a Roman cohort, a small distance from the river Pagida, it was a fort commanded by Decrius, a brave soldier, exercised in war, and now touched with the ignominy of such a siege. Encouraging, therefore, his men to offer open battle, he drew them up without the walls. At the first shock the cohort was repulsed, but the resolute Decrius braved the enemy's darts, opposed the runaways, and upbraided the standard-bearers, that upon vagabonds and undisciplined robbers the Roman soldiers turned their backs. He had already received several wounds, and his eye was beat out, but still faced the foe, nor ceased fighting, till, wholly deserted by his men, he at last was slain. Lucius Apronius had succeeded Camillus. As soon as he learnt this defeat, piqued rather by the infamy of his own men than by the glory of the enemy, he practised an exemplary severity, at this time rare, but agreeable to ancient discipline, by executing with a club every tenth man of that ignominious cohort drawn by lot. Such, too, was the effect of this rigor, that those very forces of Tacforinus, as they besieged the fortress of Thala, were routed by a squadron of five hundred veterans. In this battle, Rufus Helvius, a common soldier, acquired the glory of saving a citizen, and was, by Apronius, presented with a spear and collar. Tiberius added the civic crown, complaining, rather than resenting, that Apronius had not, in right of proconsul, granted that also. Tacforinus, now his Numidians were dismayed, and bent against sieges, made a desultory war, flying when attacked, and upon a retreat assaulting the rear. As long as the African observed this method, he, with impunity to himself, mocked and harassed the Romans. But after he drew down to the maritime places, the allurements and quantities of plunder confined him to his camp. Hither Apronius Cezanius was, by his father, dispatched with the cavalry and auxiliary cohorts, to which was added a detachment of the best legionary foot, and, having successfully fought the Numidians, drove them back to the deserts. At Rome the while, Emilia Lepida, who, besides the nobleness of the Emilian family, 
was great-granddaughter to Pompey and Sylla, was charged with imposing a false birth upon Publius Corinius, her husband, a man rich and childless. The charge was swelled with adulterous poisonings and treasonable dealings with the Chaldeans about the fate and continuance of the imperial house. Her brother Manius Lepidus defended her, and, guilty and infamous as she was, the persecution from her husband, continued after their divorce, drew compassion upon her. In the trial it was no easy matter to discover the heart of Tiberius. With such subtlety he mixed and shifted the symptoms of indignation and clemency. At first he besought the Senate not to meddle with the articles of treason, and presently engaged Marcus Servilius, once consul, and the other witnesses, to produce the very evidences of treason, which he would have appeared desirous to suppress. Yet he took the slaves of Lepida from the guard of soldiers, and surrendered them to the consuls. Nor would he suffer them to be examined by torture, as to her practice against himself. He even excused Drusus from voting first as consul-elect. This some understood as an instance of complaisance, that the rest might not be obliged to follow the example of Drusus. Some ascribe it to cruelty, for that only with design to have her condemned that concession was made. The public games interrupted the trial, and in the recess Lepida, accompanied with other ladies of great quality, entered the theatre. There, with doleful lamentations, invoking her illustrious ancestors, especially the great Pompey, whose statues stood round in view, the theatre itself a monument of his raising, she excited such universal commiseration that the spectators burst into tears, and, uttering cruel and direful imprecations against Corinius, declared their indignation, that to his childless old age and mean blood should be given a lady once designed for the wife of Lucius Caesar, and for the daughter-in-law of the deified Augustus. At last, by racking her slaves, her crimes were made manifest, and the judgment of Rubelius Blondus prevailed for interdicting her from fire and water. To this judgment Drusus assented, though others had proposed a milder. That her estate should not be forfeited was granted to Scaurus, who by her had had a daughter. And now, after condemnation, Tiberius advertised the Senate that, from the slaves too of Curinius, he had learnt her attempts to poison him, as a consolation to the illustrious families of Rome, for their late calamities, for the Calpurnian house had suffered the loss of Piso, and just after the Aemilian house that of Lepida, Decius Silanus was now restored to the Junian family. I will briefly recite his disgrace, as against the Republic the fortune of Augustus was prevalent, so in his family it was unhappy, by the lewdness of his daughter and granddaughter, whom he turned out of Rome, and with death or exile punished their adulterers. For to a fault common between men and women he gave the heinous name of sacrilege and treason, and thence had a color for departing from the tenderness of our ancestors, and for violating his own laws. But I shall hereafter relate the fate of others from this his severity, as also the other transactions of that time, if, having finished my present undertaking, life remains for other studies, Silenus, who had vitiated the granddaughter of Augustus, though he felt no higher indignation than to be excluded from the friendship and presence of the emperor, yet understood this as a denunciation of banishment, nor durst he, till the reign of Tiberius, supplicate the prince and senate for leave to return, and then only trusted to the prevailing credit of his brother Marcus Silenus, distinguished by his illustrious quality, and eminent for his great eloquence. Marcus, having returned thanks to Tiberius, had this answer before the Senate, that he himself also rejoiced that his brother was returned from travels so long and remote that his return home was perfectly unexceptionable, since neither by decree of Senate nor by any sentence of law had he been driven thence that to himself, however, still remained entire the resentments of his father towards him, nor by the return of Silenus 
were the purposes of Augustus violated. Thenceforward he remained in Rome, but distinguished by no preferment in the state. The qualifying of the law Papia Popea was afterwards proposed, a law which, to enforce those of Julius Caesar, Augustus had made, when he was old, for punishing celibacy and enriching the exchequer. Nor, even by this means, had marriages and children multiplied, while a passion to live single and childless still prevailed. But in the meantime, the numbers threatened, and in danger by it, increased daily, while by the glosses and chicany of the impleaders, every family was undone. So that, as before the city labored under the weight of crimes, so now under the pest of laws. From this thought I am led backwards to the first rise of laws, and to open the steps and causes by which we are arrived to the present number and excess, a number infinite and perplexed. The first race of men, free as yet from every depraved passion, lived without guile and crimes, and therefore without chastisements and restraints. Nor was there occasion for rewards, when of their own accord they pursued righteousness, and as they courted nothing contrary to justice, they were debarred from nothing by terrors. But after they had abandoned their original equality, and from modesty and shame to do evil, proceeded to ambition and violence, lordly dominion was introduced, and arbitrary rule, and in many nations grew perpetual. Some, either from the beginning, or after they were surfeited with kings, preferred the sovereignty of laws, which, agreeably to the artless minds of men, were at first short and simple. The laws in most renown were those framed for the Cretans by Minos, for the Spartans by Lycurgus, and afterwards such as Solon delivered to the Athenians, now greater in number and more exquisitely composed. To the Romans, justice was administered by Romulus according to his pleasure. After him Numa managed the people by religious devices and laws divine. Some institutions were made by Tullius Hostilius, some by Ancus Martinus, but above all our laws were those founded by Servius Tullius, such laws as even our kings were bound to obey. Upon the expulsion of Arcoin, the people, for the security of their freedom against the encroachment and factions of the Senate, and for binding the public concord, prepared many ordinances. Hence were created the decemviri, and by them were composed the twelve tables, out of a collection of the most excellent institutions found abroad. This was the period of all upright and impartial laws. What laws followed, though sometimes made against crimes and offenders, were yet chiefly made by violence, through the animosity of the two estates, and for seizing unjustly withholden offices, or for banishing illustrious patriots and other wicked ends. Hence the Gracchi and Saturnini, inflamers of the people, and hence Livius Drusus vying, on behalf of the Senate, in popular concessions with these inflamers, whence our Italian allies were first corrupted and animated with fair promises, then by the opposition of other demagogues disappointed and deceived. Neither during the war of Italy, nor during the civil war, was the making of regulations discontinued. Many and contradictory were even then made. At last, Scylla the dictator, changing or abolishing the past, added many of his own, and procured some respite in this matter, but not long, for presently followed the turbulent pursuits and proposals of Lepidus, and soon after were the tribunes restored to their licentious authority of throwing the people into combustions at pleasure. And now laws were not made for the public only, but for particular men, particular laws. And corruption abounding in the commonwealth, the commonwealth abounded in laws. Pompey was now, in his third consulship, chosen to correct the public enormities, and his remedies proved to the state more grievous than its distempers. He made laws such as suited his ambition, and broke them when they thwarted his will, and lost by arms the regulations which by arms he had procured. Henceforward, for twenty years, civil discord raged, and there was neither law nor settlement. 
the most wicked found impunity in the excess of their wickedness, and many virtuous men in their uprightness met destruction. At length Augustus Caesar, in his sixth consulship, then confirmed in power without a rival, abolished the orders which during the triumvirate he had established, and gave us laws proper for peace and a single ruler. These laws had sanctions severer than any heretofore known, as their guardians informers were appointed, who by the law Papia Popea were encouraged with rewards to watch such as neglected the privileges annexed to marriage and fatherhood, and consequently could claim no legacy or inheritance. The same as vacant belonging to the Roman people, who were the public parents. But these informers struck much deeper. By them, the whole city, all Italy, and the Roman citizens in every part of the empire, were infested and persecuted. Numbers were stripped of their entire fortunes, and terror had seized all. When Tiberius, for a check to this evil, chose twenty noblemen, five who were formerly consuls, five who were formerly praetors, with ten other senators, to review that law. By them, many of its intricacies were explained, its strictness qualified, and hence some present alleviation was yielded. Tiberius, about this time, recommended to the Senate Nero, one of the sons of Germanicus, now seventeen years of age, and desired that he might be exempted from executing the office of the vision Tiferate, and have leave to sue for the quaestorship five years sooner than the laws directed. A piece of mockery this request to all who heard it, but Tiberius pretended that the same concessions had been decreed to himself and his brother Drusus at the request of Augustus. Nor do I doubt, but there were then such who secretly ridiculed that sort of petitions from Augustus. Such policy was however natural to that prince, then laying the foundations of the imperial power, and while the republic and its laws were still fresh in the minds of men. Besides, the relation was lighter between the Augustus and his wife's sons than between a grandfather and his grandsons. To the grant of the quaestorship was added a seat in the College of Pontiffs, and the first day he entered the forum in his manly robe, a donative of corn and money was distributed to the populace, who exulted to behold the son of Germanicus, now of age. Their joy was soon heightened by his marriage with Julia, the daughter of Drusus. But as these transactions were attended with public applauses, so the intended marriage of the daughter of Sejanus with the son of Claudius was received with popular indignation. By this alliance, the nobility of the Claudian house seemed stained, and by it Sejanus, already suspected of aspiring views, was exalted still higher. At the end of this year died two great and eminent men, Lucius Volusius and Celestius Crispus. The family of Volusius was ancient, but, in the exercise of public office, rose never higher than the praetorship, it was he who honored it with the consulship. He was likewise created censor, for modeling the classes of the equestrian order, and first accumulated the wealth which raised that family beyond all measure. Crispus was born of an equestrian house, great nephew by a sister, to Caius Celestius, the renowned Roman historian, and by him adopted. The way to the great offices was open to him, but in imitation of Maecenas, he lived without the dignity of senator, yet outwent in power many who were distinguished with consulships and triumphs. His manner of living, his dress and daintiness, were different from the ways of antiquity, and in expense and affluence he bordered rather upon luxury. He possessed, however, a vigor of spirit equal to great affairs, and exerted the greater promptness, for that he hid it in a shoe of indolence and sloth. He was, therefore, in the lifetime of Mycenas, the next in favor, afterwards chief confidant in all the secret councils of Augustus and Tiberius, and assenting to the order for slaying Agrippa Posthumus. In his old age he preserved with the prince rather the outside than the vitals of authority. 
the same had happened to Maecenas. Such is the lot of power, rarely perpetual, perhaps from satiety on both sides, when princes have no more to grant, and ministers no more to crave. Next followed the consulship of Tiberius and Drusus, to Tiberius the fourth, to Drusus the second, a consulship remarkable, for that in it the father and son were colleagues. There was indeed the same fellowship between Tiberius and Germanicus two years before, but besides the distastes of jealousy in the uncle, the ties of blood were not so near. In the beginning of the year, Tiberius, on pretense of his health, retired to Campania, either already meditating a long and perpetual retirement, or to leave to Drusus, in his father's absence, the honor of executing the consulship alone. And there happened a thing, which, small in itself, yet as it produced mighty contestation, furnished the young consul with matter of popular affection. Domitius Corbulo, formerly praetor, complained to the senate of Lucius Silla, a noble youth, that in the shoe of gladiators Scylla would not yield him place. Age, domestic custom, and the ancient men were for Corbulo. Mamarcus Scaurus, Lucius Aruntius, and others labored for their kinsman Scylla. Warm speeches were made, and the examples of our ancestors were urged, who by severe decrees had censured and restrained the irreverence of youth. Drusus interposed with arguments proper for calming animosities, and Corbulo had satisfaction made him by Scaurus, who was both father-in-law and uncle to Scylla, and the most copious orator of that age. The same Corbulo, exclaiming against the condition of most of the roads through Italy, that through the fraud of the undertakers and negligence of the civil officers, they were broken and unpassable, undertook of his own accord the cure of that abuse, an undertaking which he executed, not so much to the advantage of the public, as to the ruin of many private men in their fortunes and reputation, by his violent mulks and unjust judgments and forfeitures. Soon after, Tiberius by letter acquainted the Senate, that by the incursions of Tacforinus there were fresh commotions in Africa, and that they must choose a proconsul, one of military experience, vigorous and equal to that war. Sextus Pompeius, taking this occasion to discharge his hate against Marcus Lepidus, reproached him as dastardly indigent, a scandal to his ancestors, and therefore to be divested even of the government of Asia, his province by lot. The Senate opposed him. They thought Lepidus a man rather mild than slothful, and that, as in his narrow fortune bequeathed to him, but not impaired by him, he supported his quality without blemish. He merited honor rather than contumely. He was therefore sent to Asia. Concerning Africa, it was decreed that the appointment of a governor should be left to the emperor. During these transactions, Caecina Severus proposed that no magistrate should go into any province accompanied by his wife. He introduced this motion with a long preface that he lived with his own in perfect concord. By her he had six children, and what he offered to the public he had practiced himself, having, during forty years' service, left her still behind him, confined to Italy. It was not indeed without cause, established of old, that women should neither be carried by their husbands into confederate nations, nor into foreign. A train of women introduced luxury and peace, by their fears retarded war, and made a Roman army resemble, in their march, a mixed host of barbarians. The sex was not tender only and unfit for travel, but if suffered, cruel and aspiring, and greedy of authority. They even marched amongst the soldiers, and were obeyed by the officers. A woman had lately presided at the exercises of the troops, and at the decursions of the legions. The Senate themselves might remember, that as often as many of the magistrates were charged with plundering the provinces, their wives were always charged with much guilt. To the ladies, 
the most profligate in the province ever applied. By them all affairs were undertaken, by them transacted. At home two distinct courts were kept, and abroad the wife had her distinct train and attendance. The ladies, too, issued distinct orders, but more imperious and better obeyed. Such feminine excesses were formerly restrained by the Oppian and other laws, but now these restraints were violated. Women ruled all things, their families, the forum and tribunals, and even the armies. This speech was heard by few with approbation, and many proclaimed their dissent, for that neither was that the point in debate, nor was Cecina considerable enough to censor so weighty an affair. He was presently answered by Valerius Massalinus, who was the son of Massala, and inherited a sparkling of his father's eloquence, that many rigorous institutions of the ancients were softened and changed for the better, for neither was Rome now, as of old, beset with wars, nor Italy with hostile provinces. Hence a few concessions were made to the conveniences of women, who were so far from burdening the provinces, that to their own husbands there they were no burden. As to honors, attendance, and expense, they enjoyed them in common with their husbands, who could receive no embarrassment from their company in time of peace. To war, indeed, we must go equipped and unencumbered, but after the fatigues of war, what was more allowable than the consolations of a wife? But it seemed the wives of some magistrates had given a loose to ambition and avarice, and were the magistrates themselves free from these excesses? Were not most of them governed by many exorbitant appetites? Did we therefore send none into the provinces? It was added that the husbands were corrupted by their corrupt wives. Were therefore all single men uncorrupt? The Oppian laws were once thought necessary, because the exigencies of the state required their severity. They were afterwards relaxed and mollified, because that too was expedient for the state. In vain we covered our own sloth with borrowed names, if the wife broke bounds, the husband ought to bear the blame. It was, moreover, unjustly judged, for the weak and uxorious spirit of one or a few, to bereave all others of the fellowship of their wives, the natural partners of their prosperity and distress. Besides, the sex, weak by nature, would be left defenseless, exposed to the luxurious bent of their native passions and to the seduction of adulterers. Scarce under the eye and restraint of the husband was the marriage-bed preserved inviolate. What must be the consequence when, by an absence of many years, the ties of marriage would be forgot as it were in a divorce? It became them, therefore, so to cure the evils abroad as not to forget the enormities at Rome. To this Drusus added somewhat concerning his own wedlock. Princes, he said, were frequently obliged to visit the remote parts of the empire. How often did the deified Augustus travel to the east? How often to the west, still accompanied with Livia? He himself, too, had taken a progress to Illyricum, and, if it were expedient, was ready to visit other nations, but not always with an easy spirit, if he were to be torn from his dear wife, her by whom he had so many children. Thus was Cecina's motion eluded. When the Senate met next, they had a letter from Tiberius. In it he affected indirectly to chide the fathers, that upon whom they cast all public cares, and named them M. Lepidus and Junius Blesus, to choose either for proconsul of Africa. They were then both heard as to this nomination, and Lepidus excused himself with earnestness pleaded his bodily frailty, the tender age of his children, and a daughter fit for marriage. There was another reason, too, of which he said nothing, but it was easily understood, even that Blesus was uncle to Cisianus, and therefore had the prevailing interest. Blesus, too, made a shoe of refusing, but not with a like positiveness, and, moreover, was heard with partiality by the flatterers of power. Now at last broke out a grievance, 
which had lain hitherto smothered in the uneasy minds of men. The statues of the emperor were become sanctuaries to every profligate, who, by laying hold of these statues, had assumed the insolence of venting with impunity their invectives and hatred against worthy men. Even slaves and freedmen were thence grown terrible to their masters, and wantonly insulted and threatened them. Against this abuse it was argued by Caius Cestius, the senator, that princes were indeed the representatives of the gods, but by the gods just petitions only were heard. Nor did any one betake himself to the capital, or to the other temples of Rome, that under their sacred shelter he might exercise villainies. The laws were abolished and finally overturned, if a criminal convict could, in the public forum, nay, at the door of the senate, assault her prosecutor with invectives and menaces. Yet thus had Aenea Rufila assaulted him. She, whom Mia got judicially condemned for forgery, neither durst he seek relief from the law, for that she protected herself with the emperor's statue. Much the same reasoning was offered by others. Some aggravated the offense with greater bitterness, and besought Drusus to shew an exemplary instance of vengeance, so that she was summoned, convicted of the charge, and by his command committed to the common prison. Considius Ecus too, and Silius Cursor, Roman knights, were at the motion of Drusus, punished by a decree of senate, for forging a charge of treason against the praetor Magia Cecilianus. From this their punishment, and that of Rufila, Drusus reaped popular praise, that by him, living thus sociably at Rome, and frequenting the public assemblies, the dark spirit and designs of his father were softened. Neither did the luxury in which the young prince lived give much offence. Let him, it was said, be rather thus employed, his days in shoes and acts of popularity, his nights in banqueting, then in dismal solitude, withdrawn from public gaiety, worried with incessant distrusts, and fostering black designs. For neither was Tiberius, nor the impleaders yet tired with accusations. Oncarius Priscus had accused Sasius Cordus, proconsul of Crete, of robbing the public, with an additional charge of high treason, a charge which at the time was the main bulwark of all accusations. Antistius Vitus, a nobleman of the first rank in Macedonia, had been tried for adultery and absolved. This offended Tiberius, who reproached the judges and recalled him to be tried for treason as a disturber of the public and confederate with the late king Rescuporis. When having slain his brother Cotes, he meditated war against us, so that Vetus was condemned and interdicted from fire and water. To this sentence it was added that he should be confined to an island, neither in the neighborhood of Macedon nor of Thrace. For upon the division of that kingdom between Remetacles and the sons of Cotes, who being children had for their guardian Trebellinus Rufus, the Thracians, not used to our government, waxed discontented and tumultuous, nor did they less censor Remetocles than Trebellinus, for leaving unpunished the violences done them. The Colatians, Odracians, and other very powerful nations took arms under distinct captains, but all equal in meanness and incapacity. For this reason their armies were not united, nor the war terrible. Some committed ravages at home, Others traversed Mount Hamus to engage in the insurrection the distant provinces. The greatest part, and best appointed, besieged Philippopolis, a city founded by Philip of Macedon, and in it King Remetocles. Publius Vilius, who commanded the army in the neighboring province, when he heard of these commotions, dispatched parties of horse and light foot, some against those who roamed about for plunder, some against such as rambled from place to place to solicit succors. He himself led the body of the infantry to raise the siege. These several enterprises were at once successfully executed. The rovers were cut off, divisions arose amongst the besiegers, and the king fortunately sallied just as the Roman forces arrived. 
this gang of Thracians deserve not the name of an army, nor this route to be called a battle, where vagabonds, half-armed, were slaughtered without blood on our side. End of section 26